All right, folks, it's Nick. It's been a couple of years, and we are going to start a new podcast series with Carl Binger of Paris Natural Farms. If you follow us on social media or on YouTube, you've seen Carl quite a bit over the last year. Carl, welcome to the, the new Bootstrap Farmer Studio. I appreciate you showing up today. Well, good morning. It's good to be here. We're uh, we're going to start off foggy. It's real cold in Paris right now. This is January 3rd. 3rd. Already going by quick. Basically, what I want to do, Carl, is go over the last three, four years. You're going into your season three, by all counts, of this morning of uh, of farming. But I want to take it way back to, I always feel it when people in your position, which is a market farmer coming out of a second industry or coming out of your, your first career, so to speak, that there's a, a moment that it finally hits you that maybe your path and life needs to take a, a different step. And I think a lot of this ground that we're going to cover today, we've never talked about. And I'm kind of looking forward to, we've been friends for a year, but knowing you a little bit better. So in all that context, so was there a moment that it all hit you that maybe your life was going to take a, never, a different path? Yeah. So I think back just to kind of the genesis of all this. And uh, I mean, it's this is so, I think in 2019 was the first time I really got into um, just a snippet of what we're doing now. And so we were living in Fort Worth. I took over my wife's, and so we're living in what we call our little McMansion. You know, we've got, you know, subdivided neighborhood, a third of an acre lot, uh, surrounded by, you know, it's a 500-house community, uh, very well-groomed uh, area, we could probably say. And, um, you know, being raised as a farmer, and we always guard, my wife and I, but that year something kind of uh, switched um, we, we were again living in this, like, I think our third or fourth year living in the cities, which was a new thing, but we had adapted quite nicely. We had already bought our land, no intentions to move out there up here to Paris. And, uh, uh, just really wanted to get back into eating healthier and growing stuff. And you know, started watching some uh, YouTube videos on homesteading and, and started to understand this whole concept of market gardening, which that was still way, way off. I mean, it was just homesteading was like the goal. And I took over my wife's formal dining room and uh, we lit that place up. It, I, I know all our neighbors thought we were growing weed and stuff in there because, I mean, it just illuminated. We had fluorescent lights and, you know, I mean, I couldn't fit that many plants in there, but that's where it all started. And then we got into microgreens just right there and um, and those, so from there, it's kind of progressed, you know, into let's build up the land, clean it out. And, and, uh, and then, you know, in 2020, we stood up our first greenhouse out here in, in the land in Paris. So, um, we have two full years under us, I guess we could probably say all of 2020 and all of 2021 now. So, yeah. Whenever you first started, was there other than a need to, to go back to eating better and that kind of thing, what, what was the thing that turned that tide of, okay, we're going to move and we're going to make this thing actually happen? Yeah. Um, so a lot of things led up to it. And again, I, I never, even three years ago, never thought that we would be where we are today. You know, so the vision has just continuously expanded and grown. So um, it's been a very uh, slow progress, I say, to get us to where we are today. But there has been a few few moments of, of, you know, light switches kind of thing. One is, you know, I've been in IT for my whole career, my whole life, for my whole working career. And that desk job is, you know, was literally killing me. And, and I still do it. Um, but there was a physical element that was missing, you know, like just me naturally wanting to work. And because, I mean, I was going, I would go work for eight and ten hours a day, and then I'd go work out for one to two hours a day. So now my days are, you know... 10 to 12 hour days, just, you know, whereas, you know, farming afforded me the ability to stay motivated or stay moving rather, keep my body, you know, actually not, you know, so it's not a sedentary job. Um, so that was one of the higher motivations for it. Um, and then as, as we've said to just, you know, being able to eat naturally and to provide this and also to be able to, um, have teach my kids, at least so they have an ability that, hey, if there is a time of, you know, and now here we are in a pandemic or at the end of one, hopefully, you know, that they will be able to learn how to grow their own food or at least been around it to where they can survive. And so it's kind of almost a passing of the baton. That was another goal of ours was to, you know, make sure that, hey, we're not just 
sending our kids out into a world that they're going to rely on a supply chain that will likely fail them at some point in the future too. So right. there's been a bunch of different things and the vision just has kept growing and growing and growing and growing, you know. I've said this to you multiple times throughout our friendship and I think it's worth noting for everybody because everybody feels that way. It's it's taken forever. But what you've accomplished in the last, just since I've known you, what, 18 months, less than two years for sure, mm-hmm. it's unbelievable. Because you have to, you have to understand, man, we've been, we've been doing this you know, we, we've been doing this for a while and we forever here, man, one day it's going to happen. One day I'm going to do this. One day I'm going to do that. It's always that one day. And there's, there's people in our orbit that they're still on that one day. Yeah. And here you go. You, you actually made the jump and a significant jump. I mean, I can imagine telling your friends and family, Hey, we're going to move out to the sticks. Yeah. Was there resistance from your friends and family? Yeah, and there's, I mean, there isn't any more, but they all thought I was crazy. Like, I still remember we were, we used to go golf every Tuesday night, and, and we'd go up and, and have a cocktail and some food, and, and uh, my friends were like, why? I said, I want my kids to be around animals, and they literally just died laughing, you know? Like, I mean, like, they weren't just kidding. Um, And so they continuously got that, especially when, you know, IT has been pretty lucrative, and they're asking, why, why would you go do this? And, uh... Uh, and so I've, you know, I've taken quite a bit of flack from, you know, my buddies, but when they come out here, like literally I had a buddy that just came out about a month ago and, uh, he said, I just, he said, I just can't believe, I can't believe what you told us you were doing. Actually, you've done it, you know? And so, um, part of that is, uh, you know, oorah, you know, I get that, but at the same time, it's also motivating for them because these people, you know, they're stuck in the cities. They're, a lot of them are miserable, you know, because they're dealing with, you know, being in a pandemic and can't do anything and, and seeing, you know, this is really how humanity was designed, I feel, to be out working and, you know, not stuck in a desk job. And, and so you still have to do that, you know, so, I mean, to get to, to be able to get to where you need to be, you can't just, you know, you got to plan that, that jump. I hope you do at least. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so it, uh, it's, it's been good. You know, I've, I've taken a lot of flack, but I'm able to show them, you know, uh, what we've done and now they're very supportive and they'll just come out and just, you know, just to enjoy and bask in it too. Now. Do you feel like you had to leave anybody behind? Like, I, I know you're still friends with some of them, but there are, are there others that it was just, that was a time of your life that they were involved and in, now they're not here anymore. Yeah, kind of one of my best friends, but it's more of, I think a, a geographical constraint, you know, like, right. um, he, he still doesn't get what I'm doing and we're business partners, uh, in our IT thing. And so, uh, you know, I, I would have expected him to be out here a lot more, you know, and just to kind of thing, but he still questions it. And of course, you know, as a business partner too, he, you know, he, he knows my interests are split between it and farming. He knows that I'm, 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 I'm weaning off of, of my corporate job, you know, to do this. It's a sacrifice. Cause I've, I mean, there's a lot of friends that we've had over the years that they're no longer with us, miss them to some degree. And, and in other times, I feel like you almost have to let go to follow your own path. Yeah. Back to what I was saying a minute ago, the the amount of stuff that you've accomplished in the last few years, I mean, you're out there every single day. I think part of your fast growth, in, at least in my eyes, uh, through a lot of context and a lot of farm visits is because you did have money set aside for infrastructure. The The very first time I met you, I, I, I think you alluded to the fact that, hey, we're, we're in this to build it over the next few years. We have a, a budget in place. You have mm-hmm. a plan in place. And you seem to have been working that plan. So as you were still living in the McMansion and the typical Texas suburb, you know, how, how were you starting to look at those finances? And you didn't want to get into any debt over this, right. but at the same time, it's hugely capital intensive, especially when you take the the piece of raw land that you did. And we don't, I don't want to talk numbers or anything like that or yeah. make you uncomfortable, but no, I could if, if, if that comes if, up, but if we're, if we're thinking about, you know, there's somebody out there, there's another Carl out there that's listening to this right now. How do you start compartmentalizing? This is our living expenses. We, we've got kids that are going to be going in college you know, yeah. faster than, than not. How do we, how do we allocate those funds and how do we plan for that? Yeah. And I think it's going to be situational for everybody. I sure. Mean, Cause it's all about, you know, do you want to maintain your current lifestyle? How much disruption are you willing to sacrifice for your current lifestyle? And I wasn't willing to sacrifice that much of our lifestyle, which is why I have maintained, you know, both jobs and I have sacrificed a lot. Um, you know, I, 
I typically burn through two rechargeable headlamps a night. You know, that means I'm up there till midnight. Now that has kind of changed over the last probably six months. We're able to kind of keep borders around that and we're uh, mandating that borders um, are there just for that, uh, you know, so it doesn't impede too much on, on family time, et cetera. Um, but so starting back again, it was, it was only originally a homesteading effort. And so, um, that was, we figured what we were going to do is we were going to, um, uh, once we sold the house, we actually bought a double wide and renovated it. We got a dirt cheap double wide. And over the course of a year in 2018, we, we would go up to the land is what it was called on the weekends. And we'd get that thing, you know, as much work as we could do on the weekend. So we did that for the entire year. And then 2019, we sold our house and that paid off all of the, um, all the debt that had incurred from, you know, getting that double wide moved and remodeled and also left us some cash to get the land started clearing out or to get, start clearing the land out and to get, uh, even the first greenhouse. So, um, but you know, when we met, I thought actually you brought out that, that shade cloth and, uh, I said, this is the last piece of component I need to buy. I you remember know? that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it's kind of funny. I still look at that every year. I put that shade cloth on. I'm like, wow. You know, <laughs> like that was miles ago. It's funny how a piece of farmer equipment can be attached to a moment like that. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. I mean, it's it, because all the same at this time, I mean, I'm just burning through cash, you know. I mean, we bought our first greenhouse was used. Uh, but still, you know, I had to labor for that. And just, you you do not, you can't anticipate the the spend, you know, at first, you know, the cash burn that you're going to go through. Um, but with that, then, you know, I had also been reading books on what to expect, you know, a lot of homesteading books mostly. And then around that time is when I started changing into market gardening books. And uh, that was just an eye opener. Um, I'm trying to think of it. I can picture the cover, but he's a no-till guy. Um It'll come to me here in a minute, but he, so like multiple times, and this is like the second or the third time that I had come across a, a real budget that lined up. Like it was like saying, basically your first three years are all investment years. And, uh, and it was right then when I was starting to catch on, like, I am not done investing, you know, like, I mean, Warren Buffett's one of his first principle is reinvest your profits, you know? And so that's what we have constantly done. And, and then some, um, and so this is our third year now going on. And so we've even this year is probably our last major investment year, I'd say, you know, we're still going to need to invest, but like major infrastructure components. Right. You know. And I think it's important to note, you came into this just solely for your family, just solely for the homestead. If you talk about family oriented homesteading, keeping everything simple, living simply, eating better versus a market farmer. I mean, there's some obvious things there, but what does that mean to you? What What's the difference? Yeah, man, again, this this whole transition for me has, you know, and as has it's changed from homesteading to market gardening, it's kind of um, maybe even, you know, reflect. I still, I still look back at, you know, kind of that transition in between them. Um, but we were actually going to homestead in because when we first moved out here, I didn't know if I was even going to be able to work because I don't know if we were going to have internet. And so... I mean, I was looking at cutting logs, you know, selling wood and I mean, going like all the way back, like, Hey, we're going to live off of selling chicken eggs and selling wood and, you know, whatever I can do in town to make ends meet, you know, to market gardening. When, when that dawned on me, actually, when I saw the aesthetics of market gardening, I mean, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. It's landscape, you know, I mean, right. it's, it is so pretty. Um, I mean, it's challenging to get that, but when I saw one, the landscaping effects, how gorgeous it is, how fulfilling and satisfying that looked. Um, and, and then realize that, Hey, there's a market out there for that. You know, again, I didn't know that Paris would receive it because this is, you know, deep South kind of culture is, is everything is there's no, you know, I figured it was kind of hippie food that we'd be bringing in. And so there was some pioneering as, as I think I've said before on uh, a couple of interviews, but um, once I realized that that would be a supplement of cash, you know, that that could do it, then it was like, well, that was all part of that transition. Well, maybe we should do this not so much from a homestead selling wood and chicken eggs kind of mentality, but we can actually sell our produce, you know, at a farm at the farmer's market and, and see where it goes from there. What were we looking at? Let me see. We're, we're like a 20 by 64 yep. hoop house. Uh, there was that little side plot, which is what, 40 by 60? It's the size of that greenhouse. Yeah. And yeah, that was our first 
30 foot bed. I think those were, those were actually it wasn't even the 30 foot. It was just whatever. Yeah. I think it was about 30, 40 foot. Yeah. So it was rudimentary. I mean, it was basically going off of what I previously had known from gardening. That is till the earth, you know, make your rows and, you know, put the crop in. And it was still monocrop thinking like I have the summer to grow. You know, where where did a, you grow up? I think I've always missed Central that. Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. And that, so very much a monocrop. I mean, our season up there was, um, yeah, I don't know, 100, 100 days maybe. You know, I think it was like May 1st to, November, to October 1st is like, you know. And so. You know, grain, big, grain crops kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, big big ag um, mentality. And, uh, and so that, you mix that concept with, you know, home gardeners. And then trying to say, okay, let's go do this for a living. And I kind of took those two worlds and figured, oh, I just put this stuff in the ground. You know, one, not knowing the climate here. I mean, I, I just did our potatoes like we've always done potatoes and everything flooded out. You know, I didn't, you know, this whole concept of raised beds and, you know, none of that was was even at the forefront of my mind. And I couldn't comprehend why would you put them in raised beds? Stuff's going to dry out, you know. And, and so there was just so many things that um, I did that were you know, at the expense of heartache. Well, and to say that you guys started out with raw land is an understatement. I mean, this thing, your plot was heavily, heavily wooded. Right. Uh, was it the where the greenhouse is now, was that wooded as well? Or Everything. That kind of there was not a square foot. Actually, there was a single swim about, you could park your car on our land. Like you could pull in, somebody had made a makeshift drive where they cleared out enough just to and we're get talking, off the road. We're talking northeast Texas, lots of scrub brush, lots of oak, yeah. lots of cedar. I mean, it's just... It's garbage. It's honey it's locust. Real thick, real these, thorny. Yeah, these trees. We th literally thought we bought a piece of cursed land because it was swampy every time we came up, and we always came back with scars and holes in our boots because of these these honey locusts. Look them up sometime, but their thorns are about four inches long, and they grow on the trunks and the branch. I mean, it's nasty. All our four wheelers still, you know, has holes all over the tires because you know driving around the property. So yeah, it was. We worked for every square foot. We say to yeah. clear out. So if, if anybody wants to take a look at the land, and I think you can look up Paris Natural Farms on our Facebook or on our YouTube page, and of course your Instagram, Paris Natural Farms, you can see the tree line just constantly receding mm -hmm. back and, and farmland going in. You also began year one, and this is part of the property I'd never go to. It's right there. But I, was, I was joking with somebody about it the other day. You have pigs. The chickens are constantly uh, moving around. There's some geese, ducks, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. There's there's that whole other side of the operation that you and I never talk about because we, you know, yeah. we're not into that. But I mean, how did that protein element fit in within that first year? Yeah, and again, this goes so some of this actually is twofold. One is part of the homesteading because we still are homesteaders, you know. Right. Um and the other part was the kids. I mean, that first year so the kids were really anxious to get animals and they were kind of born in with animals like we've always had chickens until we went and moved to Fort Worth and then even our last year Fort Worth were those redneck hillbillies sitting stuck in the cities and I bought a coop and we had chickens <laughs> I mean we had chickens it was the most hilarious thing our bathroom I mean a very nice bathroom and I still remember my wife was like we have baby chicks pooping in our bathroom <laughs> right now but and she's the one that when I go out early is always the first one out the door yeah feeding, feeding and yeah, talking to the chickens is. yep yep right. she is yep she she wakes the farm up that's what we say but and so when we moved out to the farm um you know we just kept increasing that and the kids were just I mean we were dealing with a mud pit we're dealing with I mean we have nothing landscape we have raw land that best case the dozer came and knocked over trees and so it was very depressing that first year, um, even into the second year, because of just how nasty and messy it was, which made it very difficult to have the animals. And I was being overly ambitious um, and just saying yes to my kids. They wanted chickens. You know, we got quail I wanted because of the, uh, you know, rapid pace. We could turn them over in two months. We, you know, within eight weeks, we could hatch them and and have them in our freezer, you know, from uh, from the time we put the egg in the incubator to the time we went freezer, it's eight weeks. And so... I thought they'd be a great source of protein if we're going to be more self-sufficient. Come to find out my wife doesn't like quail. And uh, so that became difficult. But And so um, the animals have really been there to, uh, you know, feed us our, the eggs. And, you know, we tried doing the, the meat birds, but at least on the quail, and that hasn't worked. And the, the 
chicken as as a meat bird we're going to try experiment this year a little bit of that but right now like kids and my wife they all kind of manage the the animal side of it they, they just they like the animals um that's what their you know their passion is they they have a heart for animals so um but we we do so some of them are pets we have a set of chickens that are pets you know we we sell all of the eggs and of course we eat all uh the eggs as well but so we have chicken eggs quail eggs and duck eggs that we bring to the market every week and those quail eggs they're so beautiful they really set set you guys apart up there yeah yeah they're nice and uh you know every once in a while when we when a kid asks what they are it's always in my interest to tell them that they're snake eggs just to get the kids all riled up and like, <laughs> 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 yeah, it's uh, it's always a good good line to to wake up the kids in the morning. <laughs> How was, did it take much convincing to leave the city with the kids? I mean, was there? I mean, obviously they had to leave their friends and all that kind of stuff. How did how did you guys navigate that as a family? Yeah, um, so we have at that time our kids were really plugged in. First off, when we moved to the cities, we were fish out of water, and we just and within six months I put our house up for sale. I'm like, I just can't do this. I have neighbors everywhere. Just so, so, for, so for clarification, you moved from Minnesota to Fort yes. Worth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so in 2014, um, moved. Yeah, and, and I'd lived in Dallas before, but um, in 2014, I'd moved back into the Metroplex area uh, with now my wife and four kids. Um, and so when we bought the land, which I think was in 2016 or 2017, and then we moved out to the land in 2019. But leading up to that, so my son was 15, my oldest, so we have four kids, 15, and then uh, basically maybe 14, 15 years going on. And then uh, they're all two, three years apart. So, but the oldest, so, you know, what's that, 14, 15, that would have been like 12 and 13 then, and, and nine and 10 and, and six and seven. And so the younger... Um, the youngest one, he was okay with it. And my oldest daughter, she was just, she was ready. She wanted a horse. She wanted to be in the country, you know, but my oldest son had developed some pretty strong friendships, you know, living in, especially living in the community in the subdivided neighborhood, you know, I mean, he had friends and they were, you know, and then my, my, uh, third child, my, um, second youngest, which is a daughter, she too was so plugged in. And so those two were really, um, the least uh, motivated to move out to the land. And, um, and I thought we were going to lose my 14, 15 year old at that time, just because, you know, rebelling. Right. And so when we had moved out here, we were about two months into it. He was out shooting hoops and he just kind of, he just finally blew up. It's like, you know, I can't believe you moved me out here. You know, land is so dry, there's woods, there's thorns. And, and uh, he was just having a really bad night, you know? And, and I thought, all right, I get it, man, you know, and, and, uh, but within three, four months after that, I'd always ask all the kids, it's like, would y'all go back? And, and within three or four months, he said, no, you know, this was three or four months after that. So about six months after he was just so and he's happy. A, I think on the, he's on that cusp of getting his license too. So he was mm-hmm. super landlocked at the time, not being able to leave. And it's, yeah. it was a 15 minute drive to, <laughs> I'm going to put towns and huge quotation mark because yeah. there's not a lot to do. And I, I think it's important. You're in the same market that I was in with the food truck and the salad club and all that stuff. And our circles did not overlap any because I'd come to bootstrap to by about the time you guys were buying the land is when I came to bootstrap. So it, I look back, I almost regret that we didn't get to be mm-hmm. uh, farmer's market neighbors, but uh, yeah. there is a market here. A small town like this, it's it's twenty five thousand people, forty thousand in the in the county, so it's it's relatively small. Very meat and potatoes and catfish and just there's not a lot going on from a culinary standpoint. But you do have your people that that come up, and, and you did find that market. Um, I'm getting into that a bit early, so we'll we'll come back we'll come back to that because I think that really takes part in year two. But now that the family is settled. A little bit of infrastructure is up. Yeah, you have enough to at least start testing and mm-hmm. playing and figuring things out. Before you moved here and before you're up to this point, what did you worry about that was not true? And then what did you never think about that became the primary concern? Um, I to me, failure is is the one that you know, like I I wouldn't be able to do this. My wife has always been my sounding board. She's never been like this sideline cheerleader, like, go, Carl, go, you know. 
always reserved because she knows that I've got crazy ideas and she knows as soon as I say them, she, that I'm, I'm running a hundred miles towards them. Um, and so the fact that she now is like bought into that, that was one thing. Um, you know, I, I, we didn't fail the first year. Um, and, and she started seeing that, that, um, progress and what we were trying to do and the vision that just kept unfolding. And, and she's a very visual person. So when I put stuff on the paper, you know, uh, it didn't take long. And before we knew it, she was like, she's on, you know, this bench. And now she's actually contributing. Like, she's like, Oh, I want to do flowers, you know? And so she's getting into it. So that being said, um, to kind of bring back to that question is I never really anticipated her to get involved like she has, you know, and now she is, she is another worker and she works, you know, 30 hours a week, at least at the farm. So, which is huge. Um, one, because she's my sidekick, she's my sounding board, she's my wife and mother of our children, you know? And so that, that is an unforeseen thing that I just, I wasn't expecting that to, um, that part to fall into place. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, just working with all of, all of the, um, like the greenhouse, like not knowing what you're doing, you know, this, they look overly complicated, you know, and, and, and they, <laughs> they're really simple. And so, you know, I thought all my plants were going to fry or freeze. And, and so not realizing how durable plants are, you know, like last year I was thinking like this time last year, I was putting frost blankets over everything. Anytime it even, <laughs> And I'm planting cool weather crops, mind you. Right. You know, and so <laughs> I haven't pulled out a frost blanket yet. And last night it got down to 18, you know. And and so I was this helicopter mom over my, all the plants, you know. And I spent so many hours, you know, and you were out there a couple of times, I think, even we did a little shooting on that. It's like, why am I cover broccoli when it's about to only be, you know, 32 degrees outside? It's, it's you know, doesn't make any sense, so. Uh, but part of that's just all the, the life lessons and learning, you know, as you go. I'm a firm believer in being mean to your plants to make them tough. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a terrible so, plant parent. Yeah. Uh, so that first year, I'm, I'm going to finally get back to that. How many trays do you think? How many plants did you do you think you started that first year? Because I'm going to ask this several times during this interview because we're going to get to where we are now. I would imagine, and I'm just speculating here, that you planted however many trays you're fixing to try to recollect that you did and probably thinking that was a ton. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we had in that first, uh, hoop house is what it was. We had also bought a little six by eight polycarbonate, um, whatever Harbor freight, little cheap yeah, $40. Where's, where's one. that now? <laughs> I have no idea. I think I gave it to my neighbor or something that we need for a coop, but yeah. And so I had a little five K BTU, you know, from Atwoods or home Depot kind of space heater. And I lined that thing up with, uh, there were shelves that were about a foot wide by three foot long. And so I could fit two, I had two, sh four, five or six shelves in there. And, and they were all loaded and I had, you know, I had the lights hung up on them and everything. So and we're talking 12 flats. Yeah. We're, I love it. I love <laughs> no, it. it was, it was probably 20 flats. Um, but yeah. And, and I still remember, I remember my son came running and he says, mama, mama, we grow wheat. We got wheat growing. I'm like, I didn't plant any weed out there, but it's just one of these memories I still have. When he, wheat, not weed, wheat. wheat yeah. Wheat. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Wheat. <laughs> Um, and I, and Kathy's like, are you growing wheat out there? <laughs> yeah, wheat out there. And I'm like, no. And so it was just these little tomato plants, but they had all sprouted overnight and he was, you know, just getting into this with me. And so it's one of those memory marks we have of, of that. He comes around and mama, we have wheat growing, but yeah. So we progressed from that and, and we had no, I had no benches out there or anything. Um, and so, you know, while though, while that's happening, then I'm like, okay, what am I have to now? I have to get these out of the trays to pot them up, you know, and where am I going to put them? And so then the problem moved from, you know, okay, we successfully germinated. Now we have to move them out, you know, and, and pot them up. And, and so, you know, build a potting table and, and uh, just kind of kept going. So within three, three months, I mean, we went from not having any plugs or trays or anything. And, you know, I was dealing with those cheap, you know, big box store plastic trays. And I tell you, man, how many, how many of those I went through that first season. But, um, and so within those three months, you know, we had basically, uh, start, started our little germination chamber there and built a potting table and built 
tables to be able to pot up and to get those plants to, you know, progress and get ready for spring. You mentioned that uh, you were trying to overcomplicate the hoop house, which we talk, man, we spend a lot of time at this company wondering where all the, uh, where all the worry about beginning a hoop house is. And there's so many questions, you know, how to heat it, how to cool it, how to do mm-hmm. this, how to do that. We, that's why we shoot so many videos is because if we shoot a whole video series a month on hoop houses and do it again and again and again, people are going to keep watching it because there's constantly yeah. these questions. Um, you bought a used hoop house. Talk to me about that because that that's a very, very common narrative. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of things that go into yeah. Purchasing a used hoop house, how'd that go for you? Yeah, I'll even add a little context to that because so I knew that I wanted a, a hoop house, um, but I had so many questions. I mean, you know, the, you you can there's like twenty different styles of them to begin with, and so it's like I don't know what I need for my context. I was I was so and and I'm you know I've been in IT, so I'm very analytical, and I'm trying to get this thing right the first time, so I don't screw up and uh, you know ca- make a costly mistake. And so I was trying to figure out, you know, which direction do I put this thing? Where do I got to put this on my land? How much shade can I tolerate from a, you know, these are all these questions running through my mind. And I'm just, I'm really confused how, how to, where to even begin. I mean, that's, and so I didn't want to buy a new one because I didn't want to screw up that bad. And so that's when I started looking at the, on the used market. And there was a nursery that went out of business. Um, and you know, hindsight, I wouldn't even. I'm, I won't buy a used one again now. Hindsight, but it was really good for me. You know, I really understood the process. Uh, but having to go take that down, you know, I had to pay people to come help me get it down. And and we, he had never. He's a construction guy. He had never been in a hoop house, and and um, and not knowing how they how they installed it. You know, they they used a different style. They like stapled the plastic down to the bottom of the wood, which you know, I just. Good God. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and so it was like, I, I, but I didn't know anything. Well, you know? I, I'm curious as to when Lock Channel became prevalent because we've been visiting a lot of wholesale nurseries here lately, and I am floored by the amount of board and batten still mm-hmm. out there in use every single day that is just constantly replaced yeah. at a very laborsome rate because you can't just wiggle wire that thing or spring That's wire right. that thing out. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, go. Yeah, right. I and I don't understand that either because it definitely is from a labor and just even material perspective, it's got to be negligible. The price difference, you know, on that. And well, if so, you think about board and batten, the price for square foot, especially yeah. now with lumber, over, you know, the lumber's going to rot. The lumber, yeah. you can't reuse your plastic. You can't take it off. Can't do any maintenance. And that wiggle wire, the cost per linear foot, plus yeah. all of the labor savings year over year mm-hmm. that you're going to have, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I don't understand. So, and that was my first experience with, you know, that. I mean, I had heard of Wiggle Wire. My in-laws have Blue View Greenhouse up in uh, northern or central Wisconsin. And uh, so I had seen and, you know, touched Wiggle Wire before, but, you know, that was it. And so when I got to this... You for sure weren't paying attention to... Yeah, right. Yeah, it was just, I was just happened to be there, you know, while they were um, setting up their first one and, and whatnot. So, but yeah, so when we got there and I'm we're like you know, taking this whole thing apart and finding all these nuances and not sure how we're going to get this thing back together. And so when I get it to the house, I've got a million pieces laying around and how am I going to install this on top of that? These ground posts, they had cemented them in. And so I couldn't get them out. And I was like, I don't know how, I didn't even know what to do at that point. Like, how do I just go get ground posts? And, and, uh, and, you know, simple things. Now looking back, like, you know, really just want to smack myself in the, in the head, you know, I'm, I'm, overly educated to not be able to have that much common sense to realize I could just, you know, either go get some metal and cut and make my own ground posts or, you know, even now uh, get them from y'all. So, but there's just so many things that run through your mind and, and uh, it's all about, you know, not wanting to make costly mistakes. And when you're buying a building infrastructure like that, there's costs involved and you know that, you know, you don't, (laughs) you have one, one shot to, to do it right. So um, at least, you know, to not make a huge costly mistake on it. How concerned were you about the heating and the cooling of it? Because I know, I know you have a heater in there. It's mm-hmm. very it's very nice whenever it's going. Yeah. Um, so the heat was kind of a second, an afterthought. Everything has been an afterthought once, you know, because seriously, <laughs> because it was like, you know, you, you focus on your current problem 
And then that leads you to your next level. That's why I was like, even like when we're talking about what year we're on, it's like, I don't, I don't even consider it a year. I feel like I'm on level three, <laughs> you know, it's I, like, I love that, you know, like level one was like, what am I doing? Level two was okay. I'm here, you know, and, and you progress through each level and each level has its own challenges, you know? And so that first year level one, you know, was like, okay, we, we had a germination chamber. We bought this little six by eight greenhouse that we put inside of the other hoop house that I could then heat with, you know, very, had an extension cord running into that greenhouse, had no power, you know, and then that progressed into, um, that's all we used that year. Actually, we didn't have any other heat in there. Um, and then that progressed then into the summer months, which then all of a sudden it became a holy crap. How am I going to now cool the greenhouse? Because, you know, Texas, the sun is relentless here starting April. And, uh, and so then that became a problem. And so I was like, oh, I need to get a shade cloth. And so, then, you know, that's right when we met. And then it was like, that's still not enough. I need ventilate. What if I want to actually leave the farm? You know, then it was like, oh, I need to have intake louvers and exhaust fans, you know, that are set up. And so that was kind of all of that first year was, you know, that. And then at the end of uh, that first year, I think we started working on getting our heater installed for getting ready for 2021's winter. It's the third time you've talked about the shade cloth. So let's yeah. tell the story. What it was is um, they were back ordered, so the the company right. was not was not. Um, they which, said, "Hey, the ETA which is why is we do it ourselves now." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so then uh, Brad had called me, uh, or maybe I had finally called in, and then he called me back, and he said, "You know what, man? We're just going to bring it out to you." And I said, "I'm in Paris, Texas," and you know, I said, "Not Paris, Tennessee," because I know that you know the headquarters right. is out on the East Coast. And I thought, well, maybe they, just, you know, they're close to Paris, Tennessee, or something, and. And uh, he says, no, no, you're 10 minutes from our warehouse. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, and I couldn't believe it. So, and that's, you know, sure enough, a couple of days our, later, you, you our warehouse is hidden in plain sight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're yeah. trying to reduce traffic. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you got the 50% and you put it up and you called me and apparently I, I thought you had like total blackout the way you were talking. <laughs> yeah. And so explain to me that worry. And just so for context, I ran 50%. Mm-hmm. Not ten, you know, the my old farm is where the warehouse is now. The bootstrap farmer warehouse is now, and I I wouldn't do without fifty percent, knowing how hot it was going to be, knowing the crops that you were going to use. I thought, mm-hmm. well, I knew that fifty percent was what you needed. Yeah, so I think that's right. I think I'd order a forty percent, or in and then under the recommendation, uh, you said fifty in. And so I was really concerned. Again, this is one of those things where you just have no idea. Right. You know, it's not like there's a book out there that just says do this it's for your climate because there's so many factors. You know, I mean, e- even you get, from property to property. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you have enough shade on your property already, you may not need you know 50. percent You may not want it. Right. Um, and maybe even your context, what you're growing, and then of course that's huge. You know, um, and so. Um, but yeah, I was overly concerned 50% because it was really shady in there. And plus at that time, we really wanted to do a lot more selling of, of plants. You know, that was part of the revenue, uh, seasonal revenue was, was growing plants. And I thought that's just not enough, especially, um, and I still question this once in a while, like on when we get like, remember the last spring, we had two weeks of rain and 16 inches. Right. I mean, if things got leggy in there, you know, and so I, I could have had I known, you know, we were going to be under cloud cover for two weeks, you know, taking that off or something. But, but at the same time, it, you know, you do that for the, uh, you know, I would not want to have done anything different for those two weeks, I guess, you know, like meaning I would not have won a 40% in our context, you know, because of just how much shade we need. I, th- uh, I think is, I think you always remember your first in farming, the first time you ever visit a hoop house, mm-hmm. the first time you ever put your own up and you go in like, man, this thing got hot quick. It, yeah. It's always so surprising to folks when, whenever they're building it, they, even before they like tie it down, they drape it over how fast that thing will start yep. gaining temperature. Yeah. Yep. And then for you, the first time you got that shade cloth, I mean, a 50% reduction, it's, it's pretty significant. Yeah, it was. But knowing the length of daylight hours, knowing the crops, mm-hmm. knowing this area, the way I did. Here's the best. Yeah. So. Right. Yep. And that's what we use now always on everything, you know, even when we're just putting shade cloth over the outdoor plants now, everything is 50% we use. So it's just so yeah, intense here. Yep. Yep. That's right. When did the microgreen production start? That was in Fort Worth. Um, we still, we were just experimenting. This was just for our own personal, you know, consumption and, and then, but that was it. I left it in Fort Worth. We never started it in, in, um, for part of our market until actually just last, 
I think it was almost, it was probably only about a year ago. I think maybe last November. So maybe 12, 13 months right in there. Uh, now, that was a very new crop for Paris because I, I did not grow a ton of microgreen. And plus you couldn't buy just regular stuff from me. So that was, that was a market largely carved out by you here. Yeah. Yeah. And it's starting to, um, take off more and more. Um, but still people have no idea what it is. You know, we get a lot of, um, traditional farmers that walk by our, our stand and, you know, everybody is. Oh, damn, boy, what you doing? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> you, what you in have the had to, world is that, son? You have had to adjust, uh, the, the vernacular that you hear. Yeah. Up here. <laughs> yeah. Um, and sometimes we'll bring our trays up even just to put them, you know, like on like one of our crates just to show, demonstrate how microgreens are, you know, how they grow and, and things. And that's, that's what really gets a lot of the farmers, you know, they're walking by like, what do you do with that? You know? And, and then we show them the bag and we have a little sample out there for them too. And they're, they're always skeptical. No, no, no. If, no, if no. you ever could ever figure out a way to fry those, I think you'd be. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's probably it right there. Yeah. But they, you know, a big term here in the South is greens, you know? And so they just think, you know, they'll walk by and say, what y'all got for greens? And then I'll tell them, well, we got some micro greens. What? It's not you a collar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not something you want to fry or put in bacon grease. I guess you could, but yeah. You grow microgreens very uniquely. Let's talk about your area. Yeah. Well, so, um, you know, we're in Tornado Alley. And so my wife, we have a, we, you know, moved in this double wide. And so she and I, we all, you know, was kind of a no brainer. Hey, let's get a storm shelter. Um, underground, concrete. underground. Yep. That's right. So it's a concrete little structure designed, you know, this is, it's not something that we fabricated. It's just a, a kit basically that we had somebody install for us. And so it's mostly underground and that's got a stairwell that goes into it. And it's, it's about a six by, uh, six by eight is what it is. It gets smaller every time I go in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's getting really cramped. We can all fit in there now, barely. But, and so last fall, when we started these microgreens, it was pleasant out in the greenhouse. And and then all of a sudden, the climate started changing into winter, and I couldn't get the microgreens to go. We were getting sporadic germination and just, you know, heat mats. We were trying all these things, and we just couldn't get it to work. Um, and so then I had a idea to turn the the bunker or the storm shelter into a microgreen chamber and also a germination room. And so, you know, went out and spent maybe $500, got two, you know, uh, four by four feet wide by six foot racks and, and, uh, loaded them things up, got, you know, got some lights from y'all and, and, uh, and just load the thing up and we can get like 42 trays, I think in there. There's a couple of them that where we can't get four on the bottom. We can only do three wide. Um, Due to the that's not plumb the the building isn't the storm shelter isn't so yeah so we uh, we have a pretty unique little grow room there and and for a while I mean the the neighbors again out here in the sticks I'm sure thought we were growing some because they yeah so we get quite a bit of attention from that from our neighbors we had um, well, I was running the lights at night during the winter because then that would generate a little extra heat and so you would see when you're driving by you know uh, my neighbors would drive by at five six in the morning when they're on their way to work and there's just these lights illuminating from the stacks you know there's two stacks ventilation and a well I guess they're both ventilation stacks in the um, and then if the door was open then it looked like I mean it looked like you know kind of like stairway to heaven but you know going down it was it was uh, it's very incredibly obvious and uh, unique and so but it's drawn a lot of attention people go down there and it's just it's like a little mini oasis you know when you get in there it's like you're in this tiny little room you know maybe so, like a scene from like mar the martian or something with right. matt damon you know like there's just something because really you, you do have an air conditioner unit yep so we have an air conditioner that's also you know it can be a fan and a, and a dehumidifier um and then we have a little, that same little 5k btu heater that we use in that little harbor freight six by eight greenhouse I didn't realize the same size actually, but uh, yeah, that's down there and that heats it, you know, in the cold night. So, so tail end of year one, ducks, chickens, quail, microgreens in the bunker, a hoop house twenty by sixty four. Yeah. Everybody's always worried about how big a hoop mm -hmm. house is, and then almost an equal plot. And then there's a couple of raised beds, you know, where the strawberries are, where where the basil yeah. is, that kind of thing. Twenty four flats. What? was your first day at the farm under that context under that size with everything that you had a little mixed garden very homesteady first day at the market how are you feeling going into that morning 
Well, we were excited. So it was March. I remember this. So March in Texas can be hit or miss. It was pretty chilly. That It was the first Saturday in March. Um, it was very chilly, actually, as I remember it. And we brought to the market chicken eggs and some plants. You know, so mind you, this is three months into our endeavor. And these are these are plants to sell. Like plants to sell. Transplant plants. Right, yeah. Like I'm bringing tomatoes and cucumbers and, you know, stuff that only diehard gardeners would be interested in that putting in because it's too early you know in in our area the last frost is april 1st that's the average last frost and so people really aren't buying plants until uh you know april and into may and here i am at the beginning of march thinking you know this would be great we'll sell all our extra plants and uh you know we i think we may have done maybe 25 bucks that first day and those were our chicken eggs and then we probably had a couple people that were just you know, sympathy buyers. They were like, Oh, new vendors, you know, let me buy some plants from you. And, and, uh, and so it, but it progressed from there in, uh, into the summer and we, you know, got to sell some, you know, produce then. And, but yeah, it was, it was not, it was not encouraging, but at the same time, it wasn't discouraging. We had a lot of support from the vendors and things, you know, we do have a, a great market as mm-hmm. far as the vendors go. I mean, there is very, very, I, I don't know the the best way to describe that. There's everybody's very helpful, especially mm-hmm. to new vendors. Uh, and uh, I think it over time, seeing these same folks Saturday after Saturday, rolling in, setting up their stuff. And then, you know, as the dog days get in, having that little bit of time at the end of the, at the end of the shift, mm-hmm. so to speak, to kind of fellowship a little bit. It's a great market. And I hope, I really hope everybody has that, that same kind of feel. Yeah. I, I wonder that too. We, and we're going to um, expand probably this year and to go to Rockwall um, to try that farmer's market. But I, I wonder if I, I would imagine it's the deeper you get into the cities, you don't have that, that continuity and that friendship. I think it's hit or miss, especially in Dallas. I've, I've been to some great markets. I've been to some very strange markets. So it's, yeah. it's, I think, that goes into, you know, picking the way and rock a, a great one. There's a good friend of ours at uh, Melissa at state 28. She goes there as okay. one of her stops. And it's, um, I think it's what, I think it's what we're looking for. You know, very farmer oriented, a little bit, a little bit less crafts, a little something for everybody kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So we'll see, you know, I mean, like just to tie that back into that comment is that we've got, you know, the, the fam, this is a really a family up here, this farmer's market community, you know, and and I don't know if that tight bond with all the vendors is going to be that way, you know, at other ones. I'd be curious to see it. You know, it's it's something I think that's pretty unique here. Um, I, I hope it's not actually, but but my my gut is it likely is. Well, I think that that'll close us out for this episode. The next one we're going to talk about what going into year two looked like. That that really began when I started coming out. So I think there's a couple more stories there, but. Yeah, we're going to we're going to take a little break here and we'll see you on the next episode. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode. We've got several hours that Carl and I sat down and spoke. And so you've just listened to year 1. On the next episode, we're going to talk about the growth during year two and then the following episodes, examining the year three growth and then taking a look at what he has in plan for the next couple of years. We're going to cover a lot of ground. In case you missed it, we are releasing every Tuesday another series from another market gardener, Tracy Lutz of Summer Pick Farm in Meriden, Kansas, as he's also scaling up his market garden on year three. So we're following two very unique and different farms right in the swing from startup to full scale. Tracy's content is exclusively on YouTube for the moment on Tuesdays. And then if you want to see a lot of video supplements from Carl's interview, this is going to come out on Thursday on YouTube. So for those of you who have been messaging us about the podcast, here you go. We have a lot planned media wise for 2022. We've been doing a lot of filming behind the scenes and we're now releasing all that. We came off a big year of 2022 with the release of the all metal 30 footer and the all metal Gothic as well as moving a lot of different molds over to the United States for tray production. So if this is your first time listening, you got a lot of catching up to do. Other than that, everybody get back to work. It is seed starting season, and we'll see you next week.